Hi again, this is Mr. Curtis, and today's topic is going to be bacteria and viruses. And if you stick around to the end of the video, I will have a little extra something from uh, four years ago that I filmed, but I still want to include it. And it's definitely something that is full of bacteria. Let's start out with uh, how these are categorized, and they are called prokaryotes because a prokaryote means they have no nucleus. Oops, that's supposed to be you. Inside a cell, like in our cell, you will find a structure in the middle, most of the time, called a nucleus, and that is oftentimes referred to as the brain of the cell. Well, bacteria and viruses do not have that they on the inside of them here's a bacteria colony and here is an Ebola virus yuck we'll talk about that in class anyway um, they do not have a nucleus and so therefore they are called prokaryotes now let's talk about sizes here how big a structure are we talking about as you see in this right here we have a human hair and that's listed here as 100 microns, which is 100 micrometers, a thousandth of a millimeter. All right, well, okay, great. So a human hair is 100 microns. Here is a human red blood cell, and it says here it is a, it's 10,000 nanometers. Well, 10,000 nanometers comes out to, let me get my good color here, that comes out to 10 microns. If I do my math right, Miss Almy will shoot me if I get it wrong. So 10 microns is the size of one human red blood cell. Now compare this red blood cell to the size of this thing over here. This is E. coli. How about some purple here? E. coli bacteria, which can be deadly, but are found also in your guts. There's a strain that's perfectly harmless found there. Now compare them to other viruses listed in this picture here. So polio virus, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, prions, oh, we'll talk about that later this year. Rhino virus, hmm, rhino. I wonder what kind of virus that is and what that affects. Here's one that I find interesting. Phage, that means to eat. So what do you suppose a bacteriophage does? Anyway, you get a general idea of the size of these things. They are really, really small. Viruses only can be living when they are attached to another cell. This is called quasi-living. And most scientists agree that viruses are not considered a living substance, a living thing because they don't fit into all the things that living things do. Now, here's some numbers that may astound you. You have about 10 trillion cells. If you took a 10 and then put 12 zeros behind it, that's 10 trillion. This is why we use scientific notation. It's so much easier. You have on you a hundred trillion bacteria and you have about a thousand trillion viruses on or in you so figure out what a what comes after trillion for those of you that are looking for some trivia that's a lot of stuff let's start uh, by looking at what viruses do and how they attack us this is a picture that we're going to use for the next couple slides. First thing that happens is a virus will attach onto a cell. If you see here, here's a virus and it sticks onto the outside of a cell. Next thing, the virus injects DNA. It will place into the cell DNA. If you remember, DNA is the instruction booklet for all living things. So now it's giving the cell new instructions. Next, 
the cell is forced to make more viruses. And then lastly, the cell blows up, releasing more viruses. So you can see how this is a real problem. It's killing your cells, and it's also making more viruses at the same time. How do you fight off a virus? Something called antibodies. In this picture here, these white things will lock on to a virus, and then the virus cannot attach to your cell. That's what antibodies do. Antibodies are very site-specific. They only work for one particular virus. A cold virus antibody only works for a cold virus. Flu virus, same thing, and all the other viruses. A vaccine is a mixture that has deactivated pathogens, and it's supposed to prevent you getting a disease. You get that shot every year, and it injects into you these pathogens. Well, what do the pathogens do? They force your body to make more antibodies, so that way you have the ability to fight off the disease before you even get sick. It's kind of like building up the army before you have to go into battle. Diseases caused by viruses. Well, there's lots. Chicken pox. Raise your hand if you've had chicken pox. Yeah, I'm probably the only one here. We now have a vaccine for it, so most of you don't get this. And we'll talk lots more about chicken pox in class. Shingles is this nasty thing that old people like me get, and it's because the chicken pox virus never really goes away. It kind of stays in your body and hides. And then all of a sudden it shows up and it releases this stuff and it gives you this horrible, painful rash. It's nasty. Here's a poor dude that got shingles, and as you can see, shingles tends to only affect half of your body. Now this isn't my father, but uh, my father had shingles and it looked a lot like this. Just half of his face got this stuff. And if it gets into your eye, it can cause some real problems, including blindness. Smallpox. This is what the explorers brought across from Europe onto North America, killing millions of Native Americans because they didn't have a natural resistance to it. Nasty. Colds and flu, they are also viruses. Polio, this is one of our presidents who came down with polio and became paralyzed from his waist down. See if you can name which president this is for a couple brownie points. Other diseases caused by a virus, Ebola and AIDS. Let's move on now to bacteria. Again, we're talking about prokaryotes, and bacteria are typically found in three different forms. Caucus, which are circle-shaped. That's a great S, isn't it? How about circle-shaped? Much better. So that's what caucus are. Then there's also bacillus, and these are rod-shaped bacteria. And lastly, spirillium. Let's look at this name, spirillium. Hmm, what do you suppose the shape of those buggers are? Exactly, they're spirals. Bacteria are single-celled organisms, they are prokaryotes, and they can live almost anywhere. Almost anywhere in the world you are going to find some kind of bacteria living. Those of you that travel west and have gone and seen the geysers in Yellowstone, yay, that would be me. There's bacteria living in that geyser. Isn't that a wonderful picture of a geyser? Yeah, I know. You'll find bacteria that live only in the air, in the ice caps. About the only place you don't find bacteria living is hot molten lava. Air, your skin, your guts, the soil. 
And here's the other thing, bacteria are mostly good. They get a bad reputation because of diseases, but overall bacteria are very good, kind of like middle schoolers. Now for the good stuff, helps you digest food, keeps other bacteria away, the stuff that's growing on your face. It's there, but it keeps other nasties out of the way. Makes yogurt, which we'll have a chance to do in class if you want to. And some cheeses. And probably most important is their decomposers. They break down stuff, return the nutrients back to the soil or wherever, and so they can be reused again. Yeah, it tends to be kind of stinky sometimes, but it's a very beneficial and helpful thing. Okay, let's talk about bacterial diseases. Strep, raise your hand if you've had strep. Yeah, you love that nasty stuff. Those your uh, tonsils will swell up, this poor devil. And then you got the uvula. Look at this poor devil's uvula hanging down so low it's hitting his, his tongue. Yuck. And then you have some nasty burrow breath. I mean, you could kill a horse with that breath. It's so bad. Strep is actually something that's found all the time in the back of your throat. But if you get run down and tired, then what can happen is the levels of those bacteria can go up to the point where you start to get the disease. When you go in and have a test for strep, what do they do? They take those sticks with a swab on the end of it and they ram it down the back of your throat. Then what they do is they take those swabs and then they will take the, these plates. Hey, let's go back here. They take the plates and then they swab on the plates and see if anything grows. On these plates, the light area is the bacteria that is growing. Lyme's disease, oi, that's caused by infected ticks. Not every tick, but infected ticks. And typically, not always, but typically, you will see this bullseye that shows up where the tick bit you and if you get that you need to go to the doctor. Tuberculosis. We're going to talk about more of this in class but this is a lung disease and used to kill lots of people actually it was mentioned in the Bible so it's very ancient but now it's made a return unfortunately. Scarlet fever. Yes, scarlet fever is a type of strep and you get either a red rash like this guy does on his ankle or sometimes a red rash on your tongue things like that and I've got some stories to tell about scarlet fever as well. Some meningitis you hear about outbreaks of meningitis in colleges sometimes. Food poisoning we'll talk a lot about that lots of things to talk about here. How do you fight off bacterial diseases? Antibiotics now leave it to scientists to name two things that sound a lot alike. So you have antibiotics and you have antibodies. So you're going to have to work hard at keeping those straight. The antibodies, they fight off a virus. Antibiotics, they fight off bacteria. And it was invented by a dude named Alexander Fleming. If you've taken amoxicillin, penicillin, erythromycin, those are all antibiotics. Now, interesting story about how Doc Fleming discovered uh, antibiotics. So he was working in his lab with the special dishes called Petri dishes, named for Dr. Petri. And he had in there all these colonies of bacteria growing. Well, by accident, some bread mold got in there and contaminated his dish. But he noticed that around the contamination there was not any bacteria growing. So he thought, oh, maybe there's something in the mold that's keeping the bacteria from growing. He literally went out and he squished and squeezed some mold, poured it out, and it was bread mold by the way, the bread mold is called penicillium. Hmm, what does that sound like? Yes, and that's where the name penicillin comes from. 
If you only learn one thing out of this unit, try to remember this. Do not buy things that are labeled antibacterial products. Why? Because it makes bacteria stronger. Here's what happens. Let's say that we have a colony of bacteria growing, and they'll call them normal bacteria, and we'll label them yellow. And every once in a while, what will happen is there will be a variety, a variation. Haha, -ha, back to our evolution topic. There will be a variation, and it will be resistant. Now, if you take, if you take some antibiotics, the antibiotics will kill the normal bacteria, but the bacteria that's resistant will survive. So now you, what you've done is you've made bacteria more resistant, and that's the problem that the medical community is dealing with right now. The antibiotics when I was a kid that were considered strong are not strong at all. They're just considered mild-mannered antibiotics. What's happening is bacteria are becoming stronger and stronger and stronger, now we're starting to see bacteria like the disease C. diff, we'll talk about that, and then there's MRSA, M-R-S-A. Man, I'm really good with my pen today, M-R-S-A, R-A, M-R, MRSA. Those are all things that are showing up that um, never used to be a problem, and it's probably because bacteria are evolving. They are getting stronger. Okay, that is a quick overview of bacteria and viruses. Now be sure to take a few moments and write down a summary, two to three sentences, and highlight anything in your briefs. Are there any questions that you want to go through? Perhaps you write down that president's name that you uh, may or may not know. Take a guess. That's all for now, and we'll see you next time. All right, last thing I wanted to do is show you this little thing that's full of bacteria and viruses. Yes, all of nine weeks old, and I just woke him up from a nap, so he's not quite happy with me. He's not really with us right now. Can't you wake up? Mm -hmm. You howl all night, but you're not saying anything right now. All right, we'll see you later.